Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. Hey guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that shows you how to optimize your health and get the most out of your high intensity training and start and grow your HIT business. My former guests include the who's who in high intensity training, people like Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and John Little, sports scientists like Dr. James Steele and Dr. Jeremy Lowenecki, successful strength training entrepreneurs like Luke Carlson and Mark Alexander, high intensity training bodybuilders, New York Times best-selling authors, minimalist adventure races and everything in between this podcast also brought to you by my patreon page this is where i provide exclusive content including behind the scenes in my training diet business and lifestyle and show what i am learning to help you get the most out of your high intensity training and achieve your health and fitness goals if you're interested in that please go to patreon.com forward slash corporate warrior it's also brought to you by the high intensity training business membership it's a blueprint i've designed to help you grow your high intensity training business with exclusive how-to content monthly q a's of experts high grade community full of thought leaders and high intensity training on entrepreneurs and private coaching from me to help you get results fast. If you're interested in joining that community, uh, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash membership, where today's guest, Dr. Doug McGuff, is also a member. <laughs> My guest today, as I've already said, is uh, Dr. Doug McGuff, who is one of your favorites and certainly one of mine. He's the co-author of Body by Science, a full-time ER physician and owner of Ultimate Exercise, a one-on-one High Intensity Training Studio in Seneca, South Carolina. You can contact Doug via his website, which is drmcguff.com. That's Dr. D-R-M-C-G-U-F-F.com. Um, and I highly, highly recommend Doug's consultancy services where he can help you set up an exercise program. Uh, he can help you with exercise equipment and selection, manipulating the variables of intensity, duration, and frequency. He can help you with your high intensity training business and he can help you achieve your health goals. Um, so whatever it is, when it comes to anything related to health and fitness, perhaps getting past sticking points and plateaus in your training or starting your business in this field. Um, Doug is an amazing resource and I highly, highly recommend you invest now and save yourself the time and money and angst in the long term and trying to figure a lot of this stuff out yourself um, or trying to use that thing called the internet, which can be very, very confusing. Uh, This podcast is one of the most valuable podcasts I've ever recorded uh, for you guys and for myself on the subject of optimizing muscle gain. Uh, This is effectively Doug's answer to my podcast, Should I Bulk Up?, which you may remember. Uh, Doug reached out to me on email and said, I'd love to record my answer to that. And obviously, I'm not going to say no. Uh, Just to give a bit of context, 
I may have got a little bit emotionally carried away <laughs> in that uh, Should I Bowl Cup episode. Had a few experiences, a few comments, which um, got to me a little bit and uh, got a little bit carried away with some of the anecdotes in the fitness industry, um, you know, and these things have to be looked at in the right context. And, you know, I think some of the anecdotes can be quite misleading. Uh, during this episode, there's so many profound moments and quite hilarious things that Doug said, which just rings so true. And I think we all can relate. Uh, and just some of the things he said were so profound and really gave me some epiphanies uh, if, you know, multiple times throughout this conversation. This will help you think very, very differently, I think, to what you know a lot of the fitness industry is saying. Um, and I honestly believe this is one of the most, and obviously I'm biased because it's my podcast, but I feel like every training enthusiast needs to hear this um and i just think this is so valuable and i haven't seen anything any conversation like this take place on the internet maybe you guys can point me to it um you know doug does talk about some pretty controversial things i would say uh, and a lot of it is theoretical um and but it, you know it just for me personally and i think for many of you it, it's just logical and, and it seems to make sense and i'm not gonna ignore the word of, of someone who i respect so so much um however uh, you know, this is an open-minded uh, place where if you have alternative views and you disagree with anything, please comment. Uh, please let me know what you think. And uh, obviously, if you've got evidence to back that up, that's really, really interesting and really helpful too, um, because I'm not aware of m much in the way of well-controlled research in diet and training, and which can really help answer some of these big questions we have about uh, optimizing gains over the long term. Uh, so in this episode, we talk about the problems we're trying to bulk up, why it's probably better to let this training stimulate the increased appetite organically. Drug, uh, drug, <laughs> uh, Freudian slip there. Doug's own experiences trying to bulk up. But Doug gets real raw and personal on this, which makes it so much fun. Uh, and we talk about the truth about Doug's own genetic hand, which will surprise a lot of you, I think. Um, I hope you love this one just as much as I did. I just think we're so lucky to have someone like Doug to help keep us grounded. Um, and I'd also like to credit Skylar Tanner and Richard Wynette, who we talk about a fair bit on this podcast, who have also contributed an enormous amount to helping people stay grounded, uh, get great results, and um, you know, understand how they can think about their training over the long term. So now without further ado, I give you the one and only Dr. Doug McGuff. Doug, welcome back to Corporate Warrior. Hey, it's been a while. Uh, I appreciate you having me back. I uh, saw your latest uh or listen to your latest podcast, and I thought, oh, I got to weigh in on this. This is a this is a great <laughs> opportunity. I was going to do it on my YouTube channel, but then I thought, no, nah, no, nah, um, you know, Lawrence got a broader audience. This will be my chance to kind of get something back out there. It's been a while since I've done anything. And I feel ever so fortunate, um, you know, for those listening, just to give you some context, I put a post out, a podcast out on my last podcast um, and blog post. Uh, and it was titled, Should I Bulk Up? And it was kind of a rhetorical question. Um, and in that podcast, I kind of explored my thoughts about it and some of my latest experiments on myself. Um, and and I feel very fortunate because uh, an email flooded into my inbox yesterday from Doug saying, would you like to record my answer to your question? Should Should you bulk up? And obviously, I said yes, um, because it's it's uh, not everyone has the opportunity to get input from someone like you, Doug. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say. I'm also a little bit nervous. Um, yeah. So, Doug, should I bulk up? <laughs> Let me ask you this before I before I weigh in. Have you had many responses to that? What's been the overall response back to you on that podcast? Just in, from the audience in general? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's mostly coming from a place of you're fine as you are. Don't worry about it. You don't need to focus on that. Uh, mixed with, oh, you should tweak this and that, eat a little bit more. Uh, that might make some difference. So, you know, very unfortunate, as you know, there's a lot of very smart people that listen to the show. Um, so part of the objective with posting that was to see what type of answers I would get from um, the listeners, because they offer great advice, and obviously you do as well. So that yeah. was part of the objective. So I'd say, broadly speaking, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, there is a bit of, you know, Lawrence, do you have some sort of uh, reverse anorexia issue? Like, you know, it, this is more about your self image and self esteem, perhaps, than it is 
you know, anything else. So that's kind of the, the response has been, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important not to go all psycho Babylonian crap like that because we're, you know, let's face it, we're all in this for that kind of reason. You know, we may talk about health span and longevity and it's like, but, but you know, it, it's, that's not what it's about. That's not how this all started. It's not what keeps us in the game. So that's crap. Um, but so let's, let me answer your question. And, um, I guess the first thing I tell you is don't do it, man. <laughs> don't do it. Um, and I can tell you this, that, um, in terms of the things from age 15 up, the things that have really set me back on this journey have been probably three separate attempts to bulk up. Um, which resulted in being lulled into a process of getting fat. And a sense that I had gained some muscle mass in the process, but then having figured out that I really didn't, and that um, by the time I stripped the fat away, I was back where I started minus some muscle mass in the really? process. And I'd actually, by the time I got back to an acceptable level of leanness, the process of having to strip it away left me with a little bit less muscle mass than when I had started the whole process. Um, and I think that the real issue that gets conflated when one tries to embark upon this as a self-experiment is to not acknowledge that um, muscle hypertrophy, I believe, is a threshold phenomenon. And what defines that threshold is the exercise stimulus being of adequate intensity to demand an adaptive change. And then the um, requirement for that threshold phenomenon to express itself is adequate recovery dynamics. Now, I think early in the game that that whole process expresses itself on a workout by workout basis. So stimulus, recovery, adaptive response. But I think by the time we get to the level where we are collectively and most everyone listening to this podcast, I think what you experience is that it's not stimulus, recovery, adaptive response. It has to be stimulus, recovery, nothing. Stimulus, recovery, nothing. Stimulus, recovery, nothing. Stimulus, recovery, nothing. For a long, long series of events until all of a sudden it's stimulus, recovery, then suddenly something happens. And there's another little interval boost. And this can go on for weeks, months, sometimes years. But once you get to this incremental stage, it does eke out over time. But the threshold phenomenon is the repeated application of the stimulus. Because my theory is as we approach our genetic limits as defined by myostatin and other elements, that it simply takes repeated delivery of the message for the system to finally relent and say, okay, yeah, we'll give you a little bit more. But over the course of years, that does add up. I think that the notion that what the threshold phenomenon is, is, um, substrate in form of calories or nutrients is where you get into trouble because that's when you start pushing with a rope, so to speak. And when you think that you can drive the process by substrate, what my experience was is initially you get the feeling that, hey, this is working. Because as you first, as you start out quite lean, as you start to add a little bit of body fat, you'll feel your clothes fitting a little bit tighter, you'll look a little bit fuller, and you will generally have a sense of well-being and robustness 
that lulls you into this is working, and then you double down on it. And um, your weights go up in the gym. You feel like you're getting stronger. Um, some people may comment, hey, you're looking a little bit bigger. But then as you double down that process, you cross this threshold where all of a sudden you're like, oh, shit, I don't see even a hint of my abs anymore. And it's like, I'm fat. And the thing is, is someone of modest genetic um, capability, if they express their genotype with what muscle they can gain, if they strip away the body fat, they look very, very impressive. And that's where you are right now. But if you take that modest, you know, acceptable degree of muscle mass and you layer some fat on top of it, you will look like any other person out there on the street. And you don't look like you work out. And all of a sudden you're in this process of having to strip the fat away. And it's so much harder to take off than it is to put on. So that's what I would caution you about. Um, I'm going to stop there and let you interject or ask anything a lot to take with me in. having just taken a over there. That was very profound, um, and I really appreciate it. Um, there's a few questions I've got on that. Um, one is, you know, and I'm not saying his name to cause any conflict, and I'm sure it won't because I know you two admire one another very much, but um, following my uh experiences where i was feeling a little bit insecure if i'm honest um about about my appearance uh, which i know some people will say is ridiculous because you know i i do you know, there are people that think i look um particularly good you know and i think that of myself sometimes um which is strange to say but uh but skylar tanner uh I, I was emailing skylar and i was saying you know skylar you know what what what's the deal here? Like, what do you think? What do you think I could do to kind of move the needle? Um, you know, I've tried doing insanely, uh, you know, uh, sort of bulk eating diets. I've I've done that in the past. We know that doesn't work. You know, you just get fat very quickly. You know, a la four hour body geek to freak. Um, you know, I did that for a month and I put on I think a stone and basically of all fat it would seem, but I'd never done a smaller calorie surplus for a long period of time. Um, and organically, if I just eat to satiety, um, I'll probably consume around 2,000, around 2,200, 2,300 calories a day. Uh, that, that could be out by some. Um, so I, so I, I, my question is, is that, you know, even in Body by Science, you say in there, adequate nutrition is important. So, mm -hmm. And we perhaps we touched on this in the past. I can't remember. It's just been so long since we spoke. Um, but surely, you know, it, they, they, they must. What does adequate mean? You know, is it is it meeting your, um, you know, your maintenance calories? Is it slightly more than that? Like, because I, I feel like calories does play a role um, to a degree. If what do you think about that? Well, there is some degree of thermodynamics to this equation. Um, but you know, when you have kids and you watch them, especially as they go through periods of time where they hit growth spurts, um, what you'll notice is anyone that's raising children and Skylar's going through this process. Now there will be periods of time where you cannot get them to eat anything. And then there will be periods of time where they were plow through everything in your house and you're going to the grocery store four times a week. And what you start to realize if you pay attention is that appetite does not drive growth. Food intake does not drive growth. Growth drives food intake. That's what comes first. So, Trying to force your kids to eat so that they will grow doesn't work. But all of a sudden, they hit a growth spurt, and you can't feed them enough when they're in the midst of a growth spurt. I think a similar sort of thing on a much scaled-down version is occurring 
in this strength training adaptive process. I think rather than thinking, oh, boy, I better have a surplus of 250 calories a day if I want to build this muscle. I think that rather than thinking that way, I think applying the stimulus and then kind of following your appetite and trying to pay attention to what's going on and then allowing that to develop organically after the fact is the better approach. Now, we both come from, um, probably you more than me because you're younger, come from this quantified self vantage point as we're trying to do this and we're thinking that we can micromanage and manipulate this and force it to happen. But I think we have to acknowledge that that may not really be the case. That, um, you know, it, it's sort of like dandruff. You know, you like to study up on all the shampoos and fiddle with it and worry about it. But uh, the real answer is maybe something else. Um, so I, I don't know if that adequately answers your question or not. I, I do believe that some caloric surplus is necessary because you don't build it out of thin air. But I think that that has to come organically as a result of having crossed this stimulus threshold. So I, I hope that helps. But what I think may not be the answer is calculating every day, I'm going to consume an extra 500 calories. Because if that stimulus threshold has not been accumulated yet, you may, in seven days, find yourself having added a pound of body fat. Yeah, everything you're saying is completely true um, in terms of what I've experienced. It's true. That's the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on 57 years old right now, and I still don't, from my personal standpoint and my own body composition, feel like I have this figured out, per se. It's much easier to offer this kind of thinking to someone else that's putting themselves through the process than it is when I apply it to myself. And I think that may be part of the problem is that we are conducting self experiments on the one person in the world. that's the easiest to fool. And that's ourselves. Um, because the objective feedback is just so different. What I think that I look like in the mirror looks sometimes completely different than what I look like in a photo. And it's simply because of the medium in which you're choosing to look at yourself through. And it can be really weird how that feedback can... Um, befuddle these attempts at self-experimentation. So I don't know that what I'm saying is completely true because my attempts to apply it on myself have been very, very challenging. But I think when I'm saying it to you, it seems to make sense and seems very true. Yeah. What I mean when I say it's true, I mean, in terms of what you said about what happens after you start this type of change in terms of how you feel and it's close fitting tighter. That was true to an extent. Um, it's funny, I actually don't feel more robust. I actually feel worse. Um, and with something which I haven't shared is since doing this, I actually, whilst yes, I have put on some weight and, you know, the girlfriend has uh, commented on my arms being bigger and things like that. I actually don't feel as good. I, I don't feel as uh, high energy during the day. I don't sleep as well. Yeah. And that's quite telling. So let me wind back a little bit and talk about where you are in terms of photos that I've seen you post on the blog or on the internet or um, Instagram or whatever. So I think where you are now is you have experienced the phenotypic optimization of your genotype. I think you've taken what the genetic cards have dealt you and through disciplined application of, you know, well-regulated intensity, volume, frequency, you have expressed 
your pretty much ideal phenotypic expression. And that probably is expressed in your physical performance. It's probably expressed in how you feel in day-to-day life and your productivity and all other aspects. But then you get there and, you know, there's when you first start training, there's that excitement of the rapid changes that are occurring. But when you get where everything gets asymptotic and starts to plateau, you have these moments of now I'm just in the day by day. And then you get this, is this all that there is? Is there nothing more for me? Um, and that's where this, maybe I should try a bulk cycle or whatever comes from. <laughs> and I think that the answer is no, that's not all that there is for you. But the, but the way to go about it is take that foundation of phenotypic optimization and then just keep hammering at that over time. And be very, very patient because if you maintain that um, window of fairly ideal body composition, you have the most ideal environment for this to happen. Because what I'm starting to get a sense of in this whole study of the myokine kind of thing is that there is the inflammasome which is largely generated by adipose tissue-derived cytokines. And then there is the environment generated by um, skeletal muscle secretion of myokines, which are highly anti-inflammatory. And I think that those two tissues exist in competition with each other. Because I think from a biologic perspective, Carrying body fat is necessary for a survival standpoint, but there is a very tight margin of diminishing marginal utility for carrying body fat. And I think that's why there is an inflammasome associated with it, because above that marginal utility in a male of around 11 percent body fat, you start going above that and then you're going to create a landscape where body fat has the competitive advantage for nutrient partitioning for any excess calories that come along. So I think when one moves forward with the intent of adding muscle mass and bulk, and you have to be very vigilant to not allow your body fat to creep above that threshold of diminishing marginal utility, because then you set up the competitive landscape where body fat now has the competitive advantage for demanding nutrient partitioning the head in one direction or the other. So it has to, by definition, be a very gradual process. And what I did was when I heard your podcast, I kind of went back and revisited a few articles that really bear this out. And one was from Richard Winnett. I don't know if you're familiar with Richard, but had an article that he wrote, I think it's probably about 53 at the time that he wrote the article. And he kept meticulous detail and photo records of his condition from age 15 all the way up until that present time. And his body fat varied anywhere between 25 and as low as 4%. And you know, when you go back and look at these photos, and I'll give you the web address so you can link it in show notes. Right. When you actually click on that and look at the photos, you're like, this guy looks so much better at age 53 than he did in his 20s. Because in his 20s, he was chasing the bolt thing, and he got smooth looking. And you can see that when he leaned down in his late 20s and early 30s, and he fought his way back, you could see that muscle mass was lost in the process. And then he stayed lean and over the course of decades built up from there and actually looked very impressive. But once you reach your ideal phenotypic expression, it's a very gradual process. But you don't continue that process with the intent of maintaining. You may be maintaining as you are attempting to constantly push that envelope and improve. 
but the improvement comes much more gradually. So when you look at Richard Winnett's records, and when you go back to Skylar Tanner, and you read the six-year itch, Great, cool. you'll see that it all boils down to about 1.5 to 1.8 pounds of muscle mass gain per year if you are visually dedicated to always moving forward and always improving. It will come, but it will come at about 1.5 to 1.8 pounds of skeletal muscle mass a year. And that sounds pathetic. I mean, you hold that much meat in your hand at the supermarket and you're like, this is what I'm going to pound away at. But you are at the point in your training career where what you have to love is the process. And what you have to love is the grind. And the fact that that ends up with this handful of meat (laughs) added to the total surface of your body over the course of a year, I think for guys like us, the answer has to be, hell yes, that's what we're after. We're not after the quick fix. We're not after the quick change. The quick change we got at the beginning of our career is not going to happen. The illusion of it happening will set you back. But I think you got to double down on, I'm going to train really hard and really aggressively and be very meticulous about all of the lifestyle issues on the recovery side of the equation and to be really damn happy if I get a pound at the end of the year. I think that's where the good stuff is. Two ways to get in trouble with this process are to try to bulk and get fat in the process. Two, you can gain that extra muscle mass. You can put on 10 pounds in a shorter period of time if you resort to performance-enhancing drugs. If someone wants to do a steroid cycle, they'll go there, and you can get much, much bigger. But that has to stop at some point. And when you withdraw that, you lose ground, and then you lose it with a vengeance. And if you've not done it right, and your hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis does not come back online, then you're screwed. Then you look at you know, competitive bodybuilders that just look fantastic in their competitive career. And then you see them post-competitive career and these people whose hormonal gonadal axis did not come back online. And you're, and then you look at them and you're like, man, I've done pretty damn good. Because when you pull all that away and see what's left, and then you have these people struggling with fertility issues and testosterone issues and libido issues, and not able to bounce back from it because their HPA axis did not come back online, you'll be very happy that you did it the way that you did it in the disciplined and gradual process. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting-edge, high-intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, 
most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the Corporate Warrior podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 off shipping and installation off your ARX machines. Yeah, I have no interest in uh, opening door number two, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and now I and, and to, well and you know if anyone does do that I'm not judging you it's just my my personal preference but no, no does. And those are those are all personal choices yeah and you know here in the United States they've made those kind of performance enhancing drugs um, schedule one drugs so you get caught using that stuff the the criminal penalties for that are the same as if you were trafficking heroin, cocaine, or methamphetamine. That's the class of drugs that they have put that in. And I think that that's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of tragic because those drugs do have therapeutic effects that could benefit a lot of people um, that it's now just completely out of the realm. Uh, but also those are personal decisions that people, I think, can make with their own bodies. And if they want to go there, that's fine to do. Um, but it's not something that I would advise because um, it's either something that you're going to maintain over a lifespan with consequential side effects. Um, or when the side effects manifest themselves and you find those undesirable when you stop, um, the regression is going to come with a vengeance. So I, I think you're wise to be oriented in that. Thanks, Doug. This is really invaluable and you've got me totally convinced. I'm not just saying that. I, I think what you're saying just makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, I, I'm really, I just really appreciate, um, you know, giving the chance to talk to you about this. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, and I know you want to, want to go perhaps into the realm of the psychological, but what, what I think is quite interesting is there's a lot of people that um, get into high-intensity strength training because they're hard gainers, because they've tried other methods that have not worked as they thought they would, um, or they don't really manage their expectations very well. So they end up with high intensity training because it seems the most, in, in most cases, the most kind of rational approach. Um, and, you know, they, they do that, they build muscle, um, and then they lean down to optimize their appearance and their health. And then, you know, they get comments from, and I, I've heard this from James Steele. I've heard this from Jürgen Giesing, people I look at and I think they look great. Um, and they get comments from friends and family saying they need to gain weight. Um, and I've had this myself from, you know, close friends, family. Um, and it's, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to handle because it's really what they don't always understand is the time and effort you put into what you're trying to achieve. Um, and, you know, someone like you, you know, you've, you're more, I would say, Doug, more, uh, from what it seems, more kind of mesomorphic. I doubt you have people to, oh, here we go. Here we go. Go on. So yeah. what, what do you yes. think? Oh. Okay. Well, if what you're looking at here is a seven inch wrist. Okay. okay. I mean, I am really small bone. I started this journey weighing, I'm five foot nine, mm -hmm. weighing 138 pounds. Okay. My best phenotypic expression, um, if it could be comparable to the picture that you posted with this article, would find me at 155 pounds body weight. 
So my ideal lean phenotypic expression will be at about 155. It stays acceptable up into the low 160s. I'm currently 166, which I'm pretty happy with. Um, it's hard to get as lean as I would like, you know, with the rotating schedule and the stressors of the job and everything. But yeah, I'm not mesomorphic at all. And my ideal phenotypic expression in terms of leanness probably levels out at about 155. So you're talking about going from 138 pounds at the beginning to 155 being a pretty optimal expression of what muscle mass I was able to build. And that's laughable. So, um, so your, your assumption is wrong, but continue on with the, what you're describing. But I'll, just, I, I'll make a comment on it. I know what everyone's thinking, you know, Maybe it's because you've been training for so many years, but you know, we see your pictures on Instagram and you look jacked. Yeah, but that's Instagram. You know, <laughs> Filters, right? Instagram. You, know, I, you pass those pictures off as if, you know, your wife, girlfriend, or kid just snapped a photo while you were training in Instagram. <laughs> but, you know, come on. We all get all pumped up. We wait till the end of our workout. We're maximally pumped. We pose the picture. We shoot it five times, and then we pick the best <laughs> one that we post. And then you go through all the little different color selections and pick <laughs> one that makes you look the most jacked, and then you post that one. So let's be honest here. You know, those pictures are pretty tweaked, you know, even on the amateur level. On the more professional level, when you hit that little, you know, um, magnifying glass and go explore on Instagram, you look at all these other people, you know, the stuff that we find ourselves comparing ourselves against are really, really um, not Photoshopped, but they are highly, highly optimized. You know, it's not what we're seeing on a day by day basis or that our family's seeing. So I, for all this time, I just thought it, I always thought you were like a really strong responder. Uh, I always thought you just put on muscle mass really easily. I just had that assumption, if I'm honest. Um, no, pitiful, pitiful responder. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's how I got into this game is because, you know, I it's just a pitiful responder. And I think that's why a lot of people end up with hit because, um, the people that are good responders, respond to the more typical protocol, higher volume, five by five, fill in the blank, you know, um, four day a week, you know, split, A, B, Wednesday off, A, B, Saturday, Sunday off, you know, things like that. I did all of that. I tried all that, failed miserably. At me. I mean, not until, you know, I started cutting my volume did I show any significant results beyond the like early beginner stuff. And when I did the early beginner stuff, I had no idea what I was doing. The volume and frequency was very well managed just because I didn't know what else to do. But then when, you know, you pick up some muscle magazines, start doing what's recommended and yeah, it, it's came to a screeching halt. And not until I found Arthur Jones stuff, started doing that, did I show any results at all. And then I hit a major stalemate. Until, you know, Ellington Darden came out with his upside down bodybuilding and all of a sudden it was like seven or eight movements per workout and no more. And to me, that was like a big cut in volume and it seemed ridiculous to me. But as soon as I did it, boom, there was some growth again. And then I went and visited Greg Anderson. It was a five set workout and boom, there's a little bit more growth again. So I think people of more modest genetic um, background find themselves in hit organically. And I think the invisible graveyard is full of people that have failed with the more traditional approaches. And that's how we all end up in this game is like, God dang, finally something that gave me some results. But the cool thing is, is that some results, these modest results are really quite something when you compare to no results and when you compare to the general populace. And when you're actually lean enough to show what you've built, you look disproportionately big to what you actually are. But put you in straight clothes and everyone will go, oh, you're too small, you look frail, like the wind's going to blow you away kind of thing. Um, 
And so when I was in high school, I, um, I entered, I entered an amateur bodybuilding contest when I, I must have been 17 or 18 years old. And, you know, I got really, really lean. And, um, I remember showing up at the show, you know, like in sweats and everyone else was in sweats. And, you know, everyone's like really, really tan. Of course, back then it was all, uh, copper tone QT instant pan kind of. So we all look like Donald Trump, you know, I mean, all... <laughs> but uh, I remember showing up at the contest and it was like, God, look at all these skinny dude. I mean, it's like frail looking skinny, skinny, but you know, you get out of the sweatpants, you get out under stage lights and everyone looks big. It's like, damn, what a difference. Um, because there is this optical illusion that goes along with that. But when you are at your more ideal phenotypic expression, you're not going to stand out in street clothes. You're not going to stand out unless, you know, there's some exposure that shows your degree of leanness. Um, it's not really going to show at all in street clothes. And that's normal and appropriate. I think we have had our concept of what muscular and big is somewhat skewed by several things. One is just generally how fat society is now in general. Okay? When you look at the recruitment re records of World War II um, military recruits, and you go through, if you look at the average weight of a military recruit. These are the guys that crashed the beaches at Normandy. Okay. Um, it was somewhere around 132 pounds. Wow. Back in the 1950s. The average. That average, average 17 to 20 year old male was weighing a hundred in the mid one thirties. Amazing. That was normal. That's normal. Now average weight you know, in someone that's not obese is going to be in the 160s, 170s, and we take that as normal, okay? You look at old movies of um, who was considered really, really fat. You look at Jackie Gleason, okay? You look at, um, oh, golly, on the I Love Lucy show. I can't remember the guy's name that played Fred. Fred was like a really fat guy back then. Jackie Gleason was a really fat guy that was a comedian, you know, back in the in the 40s and 50s. And you look at those videos online, you go and look at them, and you're like, dude, he's barely fat at all by today's standards. Sure. No one would even bat an eye at that. But back then, that was a morbidly obese person. When I went to elementary, middle, and high school, there would be one or two fat kids in the entire class, and they were teased mercilessly. You know, now it's just the norm. So our whole paradigm for what body composition is like and what a normal weight is has been frame shifted upward. And then there's all of the fitness magazines and the selection bias of everything that we see in the media kind of shifting us upward. But really, um, a body weight of 145, 150 pounds in a lean male that's reasonably muscular is an amazing thing. And that is amazing muscularity. That's an amazing physical specimen. So um, if you look at Josh Trentin in his early bodybuilding career, he's five foot eleven. And on the day of his show at age 21, this is reading out of Skylar Tanner's post, which we can link in the show notes. Sure. Um, at a weight of five foot 11, he weighed 159 pounds. And when you look at the photo of him, you'll be like, damn, man, that is impressive looking. But when you look at that photo, you got to remember in your head, this guy is five foot 11. He's almost six feet tall. That's pretty much what I, what I, that's all I am. Yeah, go on. Yeah, and he weighed 159 pounds in this photo. And this is beyond what any of us could even dream of. I mean, that is really, really muscular. 
That's crazy because I weigh right now, <laughs> like right now as of today, I think I weigh myself. I was 157 this morning. Um, but my, my, you know, prior to doing all this crap, uh, <laughs> my weight was around 153 uh, it would kind of hover around 153 to 155 yeah. um so that's nuts because i see josh trentini i'm like it looks incredible right it looks like if i had to guess i would have thought he was like you know closing 200 pounds you know? <laughs> right but the thing is we're never fair to ourselves i mean you post the picture of yourself on the internet and if you line that up against any other picture that's been posted of um, an actor that's been muscular in any movie. Um, it holds up to that fantastically. I mean, you look at the pictures of, you know, everyone when they talk about having a good set of abs always references Brad Pitt and Fight Club. And your muscularity is well beyond that. You have a well defined pair of six pack abs at 153 pounds body weight. You know, that is the reality of the situation. Someone that's built a respectable amount of muscle mass that the average genotype will allow and then is appropriately lean, that's where it washes out at. That's the reality. Okay. Um, even in the steroid era of bodybuilding, okay, you talk about Mike Mincer, who in the late 70s, early 80s, was considered one of the most massive bodybuilders out there. And that dude was massive. I mean, when I met him, um, when I tried to put my fingers around his wrist, I mean, I can close my, anyone can close their fingers around their seven-inch wrist. You know, I take my little hand, I try to put it around his wrist. I could barely get past the halfway point. <laughs> That's how thick this dude was, you know, and he's probably five foot eight. But, you know, you look at what he weighed back then at the time. I mean, he's barely tipping the scales over 200 pounds. And you look at Frank Zane winning the Olympia at five foot nine. You know, you remember those pictures from, you know, the nineteen Black and white. 81, yeah. yeah. You know, the yeah, overhead. It just looks incredible, yeah. It's like, oh, my God, man. This dude looks amazing. We're talking 175 pounds. 175. Shit, I've weighed 175. Same. I mean, Same. before I started trying to strip down, I mean, I had gotten up to 178 pounds as little as a year, year and a half ago. And you're kind of like, you know, shit, I'm fat now, man. <laughs> I got to get rid of that. Mm. Um, so, you know, I've lived at 175 pounds for long periods of time. Didn't look anything like that. So you're talking about an Olympia level bodybuilder in the late seventies, weighed 175 pounds. So someone without the genetic gifts, when you layer out at 150 pounds, lean and muscular, that's a hell of an accomplishment. We've got to put these things in their proper context right. to understand what we've done there. And then having done that, if you keep hammering with good, intense workouts, throw in some variables, do some different stuff, mix it up. But the, the basic philosophical foundation of the whole thing of doing hard work, you know, clean, meticulous lifestyle and recovery dynamics, and just keep hitting it over and over and over again, five years from now, you're going to look better. And 10 years from now, you'll be at the same level of leanness in the mid-160s. Keep doing that some more. By the time you hit your 40s, some of the best gains you will have in your life will be in your 40s um, and sometimes even into your 50s. Um, there's still time for that. But the important thing is, is to understand the long game and don't do anything on a short game that's going to set you back. Remember the long game and just enjoy the process and enjoy the grind. And over the long course, um, those 10 pounds will come, but they come really gradually. And I think you've got to be very content with the notion that, um, 
You just apply the stimulus, but you've come to the point where the stimulus has to be delivered 20, 30, 50 times before your body will relent and give you a few ounces. And then you just keep doing it. And um, it adds up. It really does. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think that's the thing. I think, you know, I've been, because I'd been doing strength training, obviously prior to doing high intensity training, I can't, people ask me, oh, you know, did you get more gains when you switch? People always say stuff like that, right? Um, and, and for me, I, I, I never recorded meticulously in the beginning, so I can't honestly say if I have. Um, one thing I can say is, I hesitate to say this because I was actually very lean before I started high intensity training, but I can say I feel a lot better with the volume. Right. Yeah. So I've at the very least I've maintained or got slightly more muscular. Um, but what I felt like was happening was after I'd, you know, been doing, uh, read your book and then been doing, uh, the training for a few years, I felt like, and I think a lot of people feel this way because they're so confused by all the conflicting advice online um, about frequency, recovery, intensity, et cetera. Um, I felt like I was, I was uh, kind of grinding my gears and my, my kind of overall approach was, was stopping me from getting that extra growth. Yeah. And, and, and that was obviously from what you're saying there and what you've described, a very short-termist view um, on yeah. how this and process works. It's very tempting to double down on the stimulus side of the equation and think if I hammer this thing harder, then I can force an adaptive response out of it in the short term. Um, but then the danger in doing that is um, gradually, um, because this is a process, not an event, gradually accumulating an overtraining syndrome that prevents you from making any progress or acutely producing an injury. You know, if you, and, and I've said this before in the past, I don't know if I've ever said it to you, but one thing I can say for certain is that your low back is the canary in the mine shaft of overtraining. All of a sudden, your lower back's hurting or you tweak your back, or if you tweak a rotator cuff in your shoulder, that is the canary in the mine shaft of overtraining. The inflammatory profile that occurs with overtraining will express itself in those areas has been my experience. So if you do something and you tweak your lower back, something is screaming at you that you have subtly over the course of time accumulated an overtraining syndrome and you need to rest. Um, but that's the problem with going too crazy on the stimulus side of the equation. Um, you know, and if, if you decide to take a Brian Johnston approach to a blitz, the thing is, the blitz will produce some short-term adaptive response that can be retained permanently. But then the positive feedback loop from you makes you extend that blitz for too long. You absolutely have to have the discipline to know when to shut it off, to keep it short. Um, because if you allow it to be a chronic approach, then you will accumulate a degree of overtraining that short circuits you over time. This has got to be um, a disciplined um, and well thought out thing for it to work. But that's, that's where the real fun comes from at this stage of the game is um, mapping out a battle plan and then sticking with it over time. Um, and, a lot of times to invoke that and get the success out of it that you need. And I found this to be particularly true. Sometimes I just need to stay the hell off the internet and don't look at Instagram. Um, and don't read every blog post. Um, and, you know, be careful taking advice from people that you think look better than you do. Um, where you really need to look for advice or people that look similar to you do. And you might really learn something from someone that looks slightly worse than you do. So anyway. No, Doug, I really appreciate it. I think this is, um, I think this is enormously valuable to a lot of people who think like me. And I know there are many 
Um, so I'm very excited to publish this and uh, I really think it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, and I tell you, all the people who listen to your podcast and in our world, when I think of training results and what I want out of it, you know, you look at David Landau, you look at um, Mike Lepowski, you look at Richard Chartrand, you look at um, Andrew Short, um, you look at yourself, um, you help me out. I mean, you look at Luke Carlson, you look at, um, um, you know, Dr. Steele, you look at, I mean, I've met these guys, I've seen these guys, you know, I've been a keezer. I changed clothes in the gym. I was like, holy shit, man, I got to get on my game <laughs> with what, you know, the rest of the world considers very modest or even shit genetics, what they've achieved that's those are my heroes that's what i aspire for and that's what we all need to be aiming for and realizing that what we've achieved is really quite amazing um the world's full of cheaters out there the landscape has been horribly marred by performance enhancing drugs and um false expectations and what what is real out there and what we've accomplished is where the really cool stuff is. And we need to give ourselves a pat on the back and um, not go chasing the unrealistic. Final, final question. Cause I know we need to wrap up, Doug. Um, have you got any, I mean, I know you have kind of addressed this in a way, uh, which is this issue around uh, comments from people. Like, are you saying that you have comments from people or have had comments on your own, you know, physical size? Oh yeah. Do you yeah. still get that? You're getting too skinny. You don't yeah. get that now, surely. Well, well, when I look my absolute best, uh-huh. no one assumes that I lift weights. They'll be like, oh, wow, are you a runner? Not even now. Yeah. Go look on YouTube. Go look at, go look at um, any of the comments on the YouTube videos like Bo Rayleigh put up of them training me when I visited um, exercising for a, for a conference one time. Go look through the comments like, ah, yeah, he looks like he's in shape and he's fairly lean, but at best he looks like a swimmer. You know, why would I do this kind of thing? Yeah. The whole bro world out there, anyone that's going to comment on you um, is going to be like, ah, oh, yeah, he looks like he might be a runner. You know, or any man it's like, hey, you look in pretty good shape. Are you a runner? <laughs> yeah, nothing takes a shit on your <laughs> sense of uh, of what you've accomplished than uh, some perfect strangers like, hey, you're in pretty good shape. Are you a runner? Like, God damn it. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, this is so true. I mean, but but trust me, um, if those are the comments you're getting, you're doing a good job. <laughs> that's the that's the litmus test. Um, yes. Cool. All right, Doug. Well, look, uh, thank you so much. Um, best way for people hey. to find out. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah, no sweat. I'm just saying you're welcome. Cool. Um, I know you're only going to wrap up in a sec. So uh, best way for people to find out more about you? Ah, just uh, look me up on Dr. McGuff, drmcguff.com. That'll link to you know YouTube videos, stuff like that. And now, I mean, I think there's enough crap out there. With, if you just Google my name, there'll be a treasure trove of me droning on and on about this crap so absolutely and uh many many times on uh this podcast but also you've got the consultations that you provide through that website as well uh talking yeah. got uh, giving people advice on um stuff like we've been talking about for their own personal yeah. goals but also obviously the business side as well um right yeah. so you can guys can check that out um to find the blog post for this episode what should we call it so i've not actually thought about this corporatewarrior.co forward slash don't do it, man. That's too long. <laughs> don't do it. Okay. We'll call it that. Don't do it. <laughs> Forward no, slash no. don't do it. <laughs> um, yeah. And for all episodes, guys, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook to get your free high intensity training Google sheet to track your training progress and get my ebook with 20 interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay and Bill Day Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss and overall health 
in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. Head on over to corporatewarrior.co forward slash ebook now and enter your email address for instant access. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior and How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and into Corporate Warrior and the How Did You Hear About Us field. <laughs> 